I'll hold you to that later on um, at some point in the summer. Okay, probably just a bit of background first. I've been researching in the field of loosely what you might call e-democracy for about 10 years, um, mainly looking at things like political participation, election campaigning, parties, and, and more latterly, and what I'm going to talk about here is political representatives, MPs, and parliaments online. Most of that has been in the UK, uh, partly because that's where I get my funding from, and so I'd like you to focus on that. But we've also done comparative work uh, across Europe, and some of what I'm going to talk about today is uh, a UK-Australia uh, comparative project that, that we did. I'm hoping that, that some of the issues that press will talk about have resonances here and raise more general questions, especially about you know, the nature of democracy and, and the net, etc. Um, so as I say, let's just go to the first one. The background to this research was originally uh, we had a, a, a sort of two and a half year project between about 2003 and 2006 looking at parliaments and assemblies and political representatives in both uh, the UK and Australia. And we focused on Westminster and also on the federal parliament in Canberra and the newly created, relatively newly created Scottish parliament, Welsh Assembly, and then also two states in Australia, Victoria and Queensland. Um, what we were looking at, I suppose, was, was broadly three or four things. We were looking at how far uh, new technologies were really facilitating changes in the role of MPs and their relationships both with their electorates and the voters their political parties, because both countries have a strong tradition of, of, of party discipline, and their role as legislatures and policy makers and things like that. We were interested as well, because there isn't much data, particularly in the UK and also in, in Australia, about public perceptions of all this, and data from the voters' perspective, uh, and how they were using ICTs or might use ICTs to contact and monitor their representatives' behaviour. and then bigger, broader questions, we wanted to just look at comparatively what was going on, what are the sort of factors that shape patterns of uh, usage and behaviour online, and what in some sense is the big broad woolly question, which I'll, I'll finish on, is well, what, what's happening to representative democracy? I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but maybe, maybe you've got some answers to that as well. The methods we used very quickly were a range of things. Um, we've done around about 100 interviews now with MPs, parliamentary staff, um, you know, uh, political representative staff. I'm just engaging in another round now between 2003 and 2008. Uh, we've also done surveys of uh, MPs' online presence, so a bit of content feature analysis of their websites and more latterly, again, blogs and social network sites. And again, we've done that on, well, we did that in 2003, we repeated it in 2005, and I'm updating it again now. Um, I have to say that looking at, at political representatives' websites sends you completely insane after a while. Huh? Originally, there was three of us doing this, and I'm updating it by myself, and it's like going through about 500, 600 sites is my brain gets a bit fuzzy after a while looking at these things. Um, from the public perspective, we also use standard pretty public opinion survey uh, data in 2005 and 2006. So we did a couple of surveys and we did some focus groups as well. So that's really the sort of background. Let's go on and, and just try and, and what I'm trying to do here is, is summarize sort of five years work into sort of three PowerPoint slides, which is, is good practice but hard work for an academic. So you, know, you like to talk for hours and hours. So. Uh, but I'll try and just make some basic points here. We'd gone with the expectation that there might actually be more interesting things going on in Australia than there was in the UK. And the reason we expected that was because the literature said that's what was happening. And we also thought that the geography of Australia might make a difference. You know, you've got um, MPs out there with uh, constituencies which span thousands of miles with hardly any population. We thought there might be some drivers there for them to use the technology uh, innovatively. In fact, what we found was there wasn't a huge amount of differences between what you might call individual representatives in either of the countries. And indeed, there was probably less innovation in Australia than there was in the UK. And I'll say more about why that might be the case later on. There were some pretty standard patterns, though, and I'll just highlight some of these. First of all, the growth of what you might call personalized online presence, in other words, their own websites, their own blogs, these sorts of things, was relatively slow. Um, 
they first started around the mid-1990s, and yet even now, 2008, you've got around about a quarter, maybe even a third of MPs in Westminster Parliament don't really have an online presence. Um, there's some characteristics to those MPs as well. They tend to be older. They tend to have been in Parliament for quite a long time. They tend to have constituencies which are not electorally competitive. In other words, they're not under a lot of threat. So the incentives for them to set up an online presence is perhaps less. Same message, again, in largely in Australia as well, I think, to a certain extent. What are they actually doing on the whole? What's the standard MP do? Well, if you look, I bet this is probably the same in, in most countries, but pretty much it's that cyber brochure model still. That sort of built for the broadcast era. You know, if you looked at the site, and I've looked at hundreds and thousands of them, they look pretty much the same. What have they got? They've got a page with their bio on it, which tells you, you know, all the dull facts about they joined the party when they were three years old, you know, they've done all these positions, et cetera, et cetera, and they've lived in the constituency for years, and they support the local football team. Standard stuff. Then they have all their press releases. Why anyone would want to read their press releases is another matter, but all their press releases go on there. And then they have their contact details. The basic sort of message they seem to be trying to push across is, look, this is me, I'm a very busy person, and I'm busy representing you. There you go. So that's pretty much a standard pattern for the bulk of these sort of things. The other thing we started to pick up on was what I've called on the third bullet point there, the growth of template politics as well, which sort of underpins the cyber brochure message as well. And this goes to the relationship between political representatives and their parties. What parties are doing, partly to counter, if you like, the individualization of it, is to provide them with standardized sort of information and standardized um, messages and content. And if I can just click on that link, I'll just show you what I mean, if this works. This is a templated site of my, well, she's not my local MP because I actually live in Salford, but it's where the university is based. Um, around about a third of the governing Labour Party MPs have a site which is more or less exactly the same as this. So in other words, it has pretty much the, the standard thing. It has this little map, and it has, you know, out and about. It has all these things down the side. And all they do is put a bit of personalised information in. So they can personalise it to a certain extent. But largely, once you've looked at one, you've looked at a hundred of them. They're pretty much the same. It, uh, Labor, sort of have, Labor has sort of a homepage that people can look through. Can I, can I go to the Labor Party? If you go to the Labor Party site, there will be similar sorts of branding there. But these are mainly used for local parties and MPs. Um, Is there like a Labor Party Facebook where I can find my MP? Or not so much? Yeah, you can you can do that. You, most people wouldn't, but you could you could do that um, if you wanted to. Um, so what you've got is these templated sites, and, and the same thing to a lesser degree in Australia as well. We came across, you know, so that you, what you've got is standard profession. They look professional. Let's face it, most people are not going to look at 600 sites. Are they going to look at maybe one if they look at any at all? So they're not going to see them all. So they look sort of professional, but it's a good means of the party at least exerting some degree of control over the content. Okay. So that's the less interesting message. What you've also got, though, is the growth of a small group of um, representatives who you might call, and this is a cliche term, sorry, but, you know, the Web 2.0 politicians. Um, and it's not only about their use of technology, it's also about their attitude to their role as well. So they tend to use the technology, they tend to use blogs, and they've started to use social networks, and they tend to use, you know, those sort of, those sort of tools and the interactive communication tools. But they also think slightly differently about their role as an MP as well. And so some of them, when we did the interviews, talked interestingly about no longer seeing themselves as this sort of hierarchical figure where people came to for advice and help, but being part of a hub or part of a network where they didn't necessarily know all the answers, but they could maybe help direct people to other people who would, and that they were part of this sort of networked idea. So 
I'd say it's around about probably about five percent in both no probably five percent in the UK, maybe less in Australia of politicians who are using the technology in slightly creative ways. Um, I'm wondering whether for time purposes I'm gonna I'd quite like to show web camera. I know I showed it to a few people yesterday. I'd quite like to show a clip of that, but maybe I'll leave that till the end. Or do you want to see it now? I don't know. Show it. Okay. <laughs> And it may be a disappointment to you. I don't know. I'll just, let me just explain. Oh, what's going on here? Have we gone somewhere? Is the webcam going to work? Yeah. Uh, David Cameron is the relatively new and young leader of the Conservative Party, the main opposition party in the UK. Nobody knew much about him. David, or Dave, as he started calling himself as well, which is sort of interesting. Um, and in 2006, he produced this, uh, Walton 2006, he produced this Web Cameron site, which hit the news, and um, it hit mainstream media, and he got a lot of coverage for it. It's a mixture of a blog, and a video diary, and a question and answer, and all sorts of other things. And one of the interesting first things you'll see about this is, it's not branded in Conservative Party colours. That's the first thing. It's not blue. It's this sort of pinky, what would you call it? Mauve, mauve colour? I don't know. Anyway, and there's, there is Conservatives there, but you have to try sort of quite hard to see that. And it's very much a personalised thing as well, which is sort of unusual in the context. And it's about promoting and marketing him as a politician and not necessarily the party, which is also interesting in a UK context because we don't tend to, to, to have that very much. Um, how can I scroll down a little bit? Let me see if I can find the very, yeah, here we go. This is the very first one. I don't know whether you can, I don't know what the sound will be like on this or anything, but you, you get, if you get an idea of the sound, let me up, up the sound up a minute. Uh, just to say two words about this before it starts. This is the very first, this is the introduction to Web Camera, and it's his first one. Now, it is either completely spontaneous or it's a complete mastery of uh, marketing, and I'll let you decide which one to. Which one? That's not the one, is it? No, it's gone into the wrong, sorry, it's gone into the wrong one. Yeah. This always happens with technology. Oh. You should never have any clips. Yeah, but it's the wrong video. When I played a different one, we can't seem to get the right one. It played when I did that. It played this one. Yeah, here we go. directly. I want to tell you what the Conservative Party is doing, what we're up to, give you behind the scenes access so you can actually see what uh, the policies we're developing, the things that we're doing, and have that direct link. Because I'm really keen that we can communicate with people properly. So this is webcam. This is the uh, web camera. Sorry. This is the opening <coughs> piece. Today I'm going to be talking about clean politics and um, telling you about the announcement we're making later today. Uh, we're going to have some great interviews on this um, service. John McCain. <laughs> coming exclusively to you on our website, and lots of behind-the-scenes um, footage of the conference. So today, we've still got a couple of days to go before the conference, uh, doing a lot of work on speeches and policies and preparation. So right now,
should say that it, nobody knew very much about Cameron, at least amongst the general public. The, the only thing they're likely to know is that he went to Eton, which is our top public school, and he has this reputation of being incredibly, incredibly posh. And so uh, this whole exercise here looks looks very much like, you know, you, you kept the kids interrupt him. You can see the baby in the background, and it's, he's doing the washing up. It's like, I don't have a butler, um, I haven't got servants, and I'm really a modern guy. So although it's different, it's also, a, it's also a, a mastery of sort of, I think, you know, modern political marketing. But it's just nice. And web Cameron has also been copied around Europe as well. So there's, there's various web Camerons cropping up. The other thing I think that it's worth saying is that one of the things that politicians increasingly are doing is basically monitoring their post bags, not just the email they get in, but also the regular mail, and putting everything into databases and sorting and monitoring. And all this is about targeting and marketing and building up some sort of relationship with their electorate. Now, if they're getting thousands and thousands of communications a week, but increasingly what they're looking at is, like I say, harvesting that information and then setting up um, a channel of online communication, usually via email, with those people and with their constituents. So that they know that when someone writes to them on, uh, let's say, fisheries policy, they know that that person will be interested if they've got something to say about fish, you know? And they can do this in a sort of targeted way. And that's really what they're interested in. They're more interested in the technology as that sort of marketing uh, and targeting exercise, especially for incumbent sitting MPs. <coughs> okay, what underlies this? This is not scientific, right? Uh, we did these interviews. We did, you know, probably there's probably about 70 or 80 interviews with uh, political representatives. And I tried to pick out the standard sort of responses that you'd get in terms of what, uh, what ICTs <coughs> could do for them and what ICTs were doing for democracy. Now, it's fair to say that most politicians don't have a thought. If you ask them, the first one we ask them about, you know, what, what do you think the internet's doing in terms of democracy? What's it doing in terms of your role? They sort of sat there and looked rather puzzled because a lot of them, well, a lot of them don't use it, first of all, and the ones that do haven't really thought about why they're using it. But you could see sort of five sort of classic responses, and this is in no way scientific, but there's administrative modernizers, and I put some quotes underneath just to illustrate the sort of things that, that, that I'm meaning here. Um, they tended to talk about the technology in terms of efficiency gains, not in terms of democracy. It's about, you know, can I do things more quickly? Can I do more work? You know, how do the, how do the tools help me, you know, get through the day? So there's a quote underneath there. Well, we could modernize Parliament. We could do more. And if we had screens in the chamber, we could actually get on with some work instead of just sitting there. Um, we get text messages in the chamber, but we're not supposed to. And, but the Speaker's not stopped it. That's how antiquated we are. So it's partly about this modernization agenda. Then you've got the ones I've already said who are interested in branding themselves and they're interested in votes. You've got the innovators, which I've already mentioned, which talk heavily about dialogue and interaction and also networking. And they tend to be the bloggers in particular. The skeptics are the ones who tend to think that technology is just making their life hell. Right? It's exacerbating their problems, it's exacerbating their workload. So the quote under there, we asked someone about why, why they didn't have a web presence, essentially. And they started to, to go into a rant about blogs. And they said, well, blogs, interactive democracy, and like, we just haven't got the time. Right? MPs have bursts of enthusiasm, and then reality bites, and it gathers dust. A couple of weeks enthusiasm, and then nothing. There has to be a hard evaluation of the benefits. And my suspicion is the returns are marginal, returns are minimal. In fact, it's probably more trouble than it's worth. And there's a real core of underlying skepticism when you interview representatives about, about technology. And then the last one that I liked uh, <laughs> um, are the fatalists. There's a lot of fatalists hanging around out there, mainly government backbench <coughs> MPs who know their careers are going nowhere and uh, are disillusioned with life in, in total. This first quote <laughs> underneath there came when the tape went off. So it was the end of the interview. And, and he just sat, he, he'd sat glumly through the interview. And he said, well, we're fucked, basically. <laughs> he said, parties, parties are finished. He said, look around this place. We were sitting in, he said, no one cares about this place. He said, we're, we're finished. Everything's done for. Um, which was nice. I wish he'd done it on tape, but anyway, there we go. And then the, the second quote is from someone in the Scottish Parliament. And what I have a feeling was, he's a fairly senior figure. I forget exactly which. 
And he just said, well, he said, look, let's face it, there's always going to be the lumpen proletariat, uh, he was a left-wing MP, by the way, um, <laughs> who think that we're all eating and drinking at the public's expense and we're only in it for ourselves. And then he said, but hey, that's democracy. <laughs> so, And he said, technology ain't going to do anything to change that. So you've got those sort of responses. <clears throat> in comparative terms, I suppose this is the sort of academic coming out of me here, so sorry about this. What actually, what were the things that were shaping and driving and also producing hurdles to, to the way that politicians and parliaments were using it? And, and I tried to break these up into three things. There's the systemic level, and I think I picked out two things that were important in the context of this project. The participatory and electoral context. One of the drivers for using technology in the UK, or for at least getting people interested in it, was the fact that electoral turnout dropped dramatically in 2001. Only 59% of the electorate turned out at the general election in 2001, and that rose only a very small amount in 2005, about 62 63%, and particularly amongst younger voters. And there was an air of crisis. And so politicians and think tanks and journalists all jumped on the idea that somehow technology might provide a magic bullet. Uh, it doesn't, but, so, but that was a driving force. Now, in the Australian context, that sort of masked. The same sort of problems are there, but they've got compulsory voting. So you don't see that, that catalyst dramatic effect in terms of dropping turnout. And I think that's quite important in the understanding of these sort of things. <laughs> Federalism, I think, would be quite important in the Australian context. You've got competition between the states. The two states that we looked at, Queensland and Victoria, Queensland had built quite a big reputation on its e-government, e-democracy initiatives. Victoria followed suit, but wanted to be better. And there's a competitive environment going on there. The second level, institutional organizational level, I think in order to understand politicians' use of technology and also parliaments, you need to know a lot about the culture and the norms of those institutions and not necessarily about the, the, the technology itself. Um, I've listed a few things there. One thing I'd say that that underlies maybe politicians' skepticism here is, is their everyday life as politicians. Uh, and I'm, maybe it's going to take a whole generational change to, to shift this. But as politicians, they're not desk bound. So a lot of them don't sit with a computer very much apart from maybe on a train if they're going somewhere they might have a laptop. They spend their time going to meetings. The way they've been brought up, even before being an MP, is to go to party meetings, is to knock on doors, is to do the public face-to-face -face stuff, kissing babies, all that sort of stuff. That's what they value. Face-to-face -face is the ultimate. Technology, they're not really that interested and they don't use it that much. The staff are the ones that use it for them. Um, and so the everyday culture it's not built around technology. It's not built around... You know, I have to think about that because I'm always you know, fiddling about with a laptop or a computer. They're not. They don't do much of that. Um, I'll just say one little anecdote, and this is coming out in Australia. Australia. There's no Australians here, are there? Okay. Well, apologies if I attempt a very bad Australian accent. But I did this interview, and uh, it was in Queensland, I think, and... Uh, the politician said to me, um, we're talking about technology, and he said, ah, oh, geez, mate. He said, technology. He said, no, he said, I like to see the whites of their eyes. I want to debate with people. I don't want to look through a screen or touch a keyboard. And there's this sort of, uh, it, I have to say that in Australia it does fulfill certain of the cliches. There's a macho element to it, you know, about I really want to debate, but I want to debate physically with someone, not through a, through a computer. I'm not going to go into to, to all of these because we haven't got time. But, but uh, in the UK, one of the things that distinguished it from Australia was the external scrutiny. At the federal level in Australia, I have to say, there wasn't much going on and they weren't under much pressure to do much. In the UK, you've got um, My Society, which is an interesting organisation. I think some people, John Palfrey is not here, will know Tom Steinberg of My Society quite well. Lots of initiatives from them. We can look at those after I finish talking, if you want to look at some of those, to pressurise MPs to do things online, but also to scrutinise what MPs are doing. And the Hansard Society also giving assistance to MPs if they wanted to blog, if they wanted to do things. So there was real sort of, there was assistance there if they wanted it, but there was also scrutiny and pressure to do it, which didn't exist <coughs> at the same level, certainly not at the federal level. And then at the individual level, what's important to MPs? 
constituency environment. If they're in a marginal constituency with high levels of internet access, you can be sure they would make use of the tools. If they weren't, if they were in a safe constituency where their majority is quite large and you know maybe they didn't have a large amount of students in the constituency who are often a driver for using this technology, they wouldn't make much use of it. What that does is underpins a sort of digital divide in terms of representation. I'm not going to say too much more about those since we get on to the last couple of slides. So what's the public's response about this? As I say, we did survey and uh, we did we did also focus group work um, in the UK and Australia. Uh, just to give the basics, online contacting and visiting MPs' websites and blogs and all that stuff is pretty low. I think the figures for the UK were something like about 3% of the public had ever visited an MP's site. I think 5% had been to the Parliament's main site. In Australia, it's significantly bigger. Maybe that's to do with geography. I'm not quite sure. Um, something like three times as big as the UK. But it is growing, and it's growing amongst young people, partly because of education and use in schools prompting them to go. They, they wouldn't go off their own bat, but they have to go through school. So there, there's some of that. What was interesting in the focus groups was, though, that the expectations and interest in online communication and impulse appeared quite high. So they expected politicians to be doing quite a lot. And um, they expected that politicians <coughs> should have websites and should be doing and should be interacting and should be accessible. But it was a mainly sort of consumeristic approach. They weren't necessarily interested in visiting it. Particularly if they had a problem, they might do it. If they wanted something, they might do it. The other thing to say about it was that online communication they thought was very useful and the internet was very useful and it was going to be useful to democracy, but not for them, it was always for other people. So particularly, they, they also, if you had the focus groups there, they'd also, oh, it's going to be useful for young people. But then the young people also said, well, it's not going to be useful, it's going to be useful for those people who are interested in, you know, those middle-aged, sad political anoraks who want to look at it, like, like me, basically. Um, so it was always useful, but useful for other people, never directly themselves. The people who use it the most, and this will come as no surprise, I'm, I'm sure, to you, are, of course, the ones who contact their MPs online, the ones who read the sites, the ones who engage politically online, were the ones who are politically interested already, the politically engaged already. <coughs> they did tended to be maybe 30s to mid-40s. They did to be middle-class professionals. They're the online engaged. That sounds like, again, that I'm describing myself. You know, it's the sort of male, middle-class professional in his uh, 30s to early 40s. The danger that MPs felt about this was that you're simply exacerbating, again, the participation gaps. That unless you use the technology creatively, you're simply going to amplify the voices of those who are already prominent within the system. The last point I'd say is that the parliamentary and technological environment matters. So, for instance, in Australia, there's real problems with broadband in... in you know, very rural areas. Now, it's quite clear that once you switch over to broadband, people do a lot more things online. Um, they go to a lot more places, they use it for longer, not surprising there, and that matters. And let me do my very last slide, because I know it's talking, danger of talking for too long. What does all this mean? I'd, I'm still trying to puzzle after quite a long time about what, what all this adds up to, what's, what's there. I think... What we're entering, really, and what we have entered is perhaps an era of, of, of difficult democracy. I think life's getting tougher for politicians, and you might say, good, that's mm -hmm. a good thing. Uh, let's make it really tough for them. But I, I do have some sympathies for them. I, I, they work harder than perhaps, well, certainly in the UK, they work harder than they've done in the past. They do more. They spend more time answering constituents' letters. They spend more time in the constituency. They do all sorts of things. And yet the more they do, the more we hate them, broadly speaking. What is the technology? Where's that fitting in with all this? Well, out of the interviews and out of other things, I think there was a number of pressures that were, were emerging there that, that MPs talked about and felt they were under. The first one is disaggregation and acceleration, that, that it was hard to package issues anymore, that issues were appearing all over the place. Politicians weren't quite sure where they were coming from anymore. How could they fit things together? How could they build broad policy packages? The speed of everything was quite bewildering for some of them, you know? They used to have, the, the old certainties are breaking down. What can they grip onto? I've already mentioned amplification. The noise levels, uh, 
just in general, uh, you know, email has added to that. You know, so they're hit all over the place with this stuff. But their fear was that it was amplifying people that are already pre-advantaged. You know, and they were the ones who were making use of the technology. And unless you did something about this, you were simply going to get then the third bullet point, an increasing sort of fragmentation of representation. And you can see that because if you're in a in a relatively deprived constituency that internet access is difficult. Your MP also won't be doing much with the technology. You're increasingly becoming a, a, even more of a disadvantage than the constituency next door where there's high levels of connectivity, that maybe you know, you've got a university in, in, in there as well. People are using the technology. They can access services more easily. And then also what politicians are worried about was unrealistic expectations. And this comes through in the focus groups that, let's like say, that the expectation levels are enormous, and then the levels of disappointment are also enormous as well. And that there is a feeling that maybe the technology might add to that. The potential remains, I think, there, just because I don't want to finish too depressingly, so I've got to say that the potential does remain there. And Stephen Coleman has, has talked quite a lot, one of my former colleagues at the Oxford Internet Institute, about conversational democracy. And there is some potential, I think, there to make a more continuous sort of representation, that it's not just about election periods where politicians talk to the electorate, which is one of the common complaints. You know, that you can now have a dialogue over a longer period of time, you can have a conversation. Potentially that policymakers can make themselves more informed and more aware, but equally the public can be more informed and more aware of possibly what, you know, what are the restraints and restrictions on politicians as well. The potential is there to do that, but as I say, the hurdles are pretty huge um, in terms of doing that. But as I say, I'm, I'm still puzzling in, in part about what it all means, and I think that's a good place to stop. So thank you. You know, here in the United States, you know, some politicians have been doing elaborate things on the internet for years, you know, uh, including, you know, use of databases for targeting. But here, I think the big driver is not constituent service, but fundraising. Now, how, how does the need for fundraising, you know, in the country you study, you know, compare to, you know, the massive amounts of money that politicians try to raise here? Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> that's a good point. I say the UK is not a halfway house. But it's not through these politician sites because they're not allowed to raise money through, especially if there's parliamentary expenses going into their sites. So they're not allowed to do online fundraising through that. Um, so it's the parties generally that do that. And the UK uh, does tend to follow, is increasingly at a lower level, trying to follow that American model of trying to raise money as being one of the central aims of using, especially in election periods. But through these sorts of sites, they're not really allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. Other countries, <laughs> Australia, again, to a lesser degree. If you go to continental Europe, for instance, where there's state funding for parties, you don't see this at all. Mm -hmm. Funding's not, not necessarily much of an issue. So you can, see, you can see the way that, for instance, political... That's a good example of the way that political rules and systemic rules have an influence on what they do online. Mm -hmm. But the UK parties now will be looking very closely at what McCain, Obama, and Clinton are doing in terms of because that's where they get their lessons from. So the UK is always seen as a sort of halfway house mm -hmm. follower to the, to the US. I think you were first. Okay. Well, one thing at the Internet and Democracy Project that we've been thinking about, or at least I have lately, um, is uh, the essentially the methodology of understanding the internet's effect on democracy? You know, what as a researcher in the UK, what um, quantitative or otherwise methodologies have you seen that are useful be besides the anecdotal? Yeah, we. I suppose the first thing I should say is that we try and just use a range. Is it triangulation? That's a sort of horrible word. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> In terms of quant, I'm not a quant person. The, the people I work with, Rachel Gibson and Vinyl Lizzoli, are the quant people on the on the on the team. So we've used the pre, the, the standard sort of quant methodologies, the survey stuff. Um, and there isn't certainly in Europe. There's not a lot of 
quants data on the internet, and, and it's a real frustration. There's not much from, again, the, the user perspective is the wrong way to look at it. There's not much there. So we've used the standard tool. The other thing we started to get, get to on the Australian side is also to, to looking at, at network analysis, and I'm no expert on that, but also to use um, you know, hyperlink calling and those sort of things as new means of mining data. But we've gone for fairly, I, I guess, fairly standard, standard methods. But we tried to go for a range, neither quantitative nor qualitative, but a lot. What we'd really like to do, but you can never get that. In the UK, it's horrendous trying to get data out of the parties or the MPs and stuff. What we'd really like to do is look at uh, the data and the traffic on the sites and things like that. But they won't give it to us. There's no way they'll give it to us. I'm really jealous of countries like the Netherlands. One of my colleagues in the Netherlands. Parties give him all sorts of things. It's fantastic. I just love that. But <laughs> UK parties don't give him anything <coughs> at all. But I just think a, a, a range of methodologies is possibly the key. But I think we do need good quality uh, quantitative stuff in, you know, is lacking in Europe. I think. Yeah, you were next. Well, I wanted to thank you for this research in particular because at least um, here, a lot of what we look at tends to be from the citizen and the voter perspective, and so to actually look at how what are the politicians' attitudes towards the technology is really important because it's, it's, it's a two-way street. Um, what strikes me about what you've described here is that the politicians, as you would expect, look at the technology in the same way that a company would look at the technology, which is kind of what companies would call customer relationship management. I've seen government here call it citizen relationship management, which sounds kind of <laughs> ominous. <laughs> I, I think one of the ominous things about it is the idea that you, it, I, mean, I, I think it's reinforced by the way you're describing the kinds of technology they're creating, is that it's about creating a relationship between the um, politician and the individual, which is um, kind of, is it, at least in the states, and, and I know that the parties work differently in, in the UK, especially, um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's power here tends to be more built through associations, not by individual citizen participation. So the more that they're emphasizing individual citizen relationships, the more you're <coughs> breaking apart the electorate into these kind of atomized individuals, which is probably not how the electorate sees itself either. And so, to some extent, I'm wondering if if the interesting thing is going to thing that's going to be happening is going to be more how are the politicians going to take on groups. At least here in the in, in the states, we've got move on and, and kind of large national groups, and I don't know if there's quite as much on the local level. But um, is is how are they relating to these kinds of groups of people on the the, the web and the internet rather than individual citizens? I think you're. I'm not sure I've got an, a good answer for that. I think you're entirely right that the, the a lot of the the way they look at it is on that individualized, atomized relationship. I'm not sure. It's, this, when we did the focus groups, we didn't do enough to really get a good angle. Was, I was surprised how much also the citizens tended to mirror that as well and talked in very individualistic, very, um, what should we say, well, it was, an inf it was an information. If they wanted it, then it was individualised information seeking that was the driver. They didn't tend to talk in. And when we did the survey work also in, on other projects, one of the things we, we found is that people were less interested in the networking um, the participatory angle, the meeting other people. What they were interested in was getting hold of information themselves. That was the real driver. So, so in some ways, you could say the politicians are not that far apart. It appeared from mm -hmm. from from their, you know, the voters. What I think, in terms of responding to groups, yeah, we don't have. I don't think we've got anything really like like move on to the same. So that, I mean, I wonder if the politicians have incentives to keep you in the. I mean, I'm thinking about if I have a pothole yeah. on my street, like the most basic governance yeah. issues, it's much more powerful for me to get all my neighbors together and say, we, we, 10 of us, 20 of us want this thing fixed, and yeah. I just sent in a, a message. And a site like this doesn't, even if you got 20 of your friends to all do it at the same time, you don't get any sense that you're all doing it together. I think... I think party bosses, for instance, party leadership like that sort of individualised relationship. So you can see that. You can see that in terms of the, the, the particularly the Labour Party under Tony Blair would have been a classic example of this. The appeal was always not to activists and to local parties. The appeal would be to individual supporters and members. That's where they aimed at because, you know, 
in a way, that's a way of you know ameliorating the power of, of yeah. local yeah. activists and groups and the collective power of that. So that was always the aim, and you can see that reflected also in some of the initiatives that the Labour government has taken. Um, for instance, online petitioning. I hate the online. <laughs> webcast, man. I'm really, sorry, Tom Steinberg, I really don't like that online <laughs> petition site, the number 10 one. What it encourages is a sort of the idea of a direct relationship between you as an individual citizen, okay, you can network with other citizens and you get this petition, and somehow the Prime Minister or government departments, Parliament doesn't appear in the picture. Well, that's partly their own fault because they're slow at responding and they're now thinking about online petitioning. But this sort of petitions model, again, seems to be built very much around that sort of individualised sort of model and consumerist model as well you know and I think there's competing things going on that's why I said that that the real innovative MPs and they're a handful they also talk about it they don't just talk about the technology because the technology is something they talk about their role as a sort of networker I think that's that's sort of interesting so they're much more on the Stephen Coleman conversational democracy you know networking dialogue model the bulk of it, though, seems to be this sort of consumeristic, individualist you know, model. That's the one that seems to be winning, if anything. Yeah, I can't remember who's done it. Uh, you seem to have a, a somewhat of an Anglo-Saxon uh, orientation in terms of your, your, your research. <clears throat> Do you believe that the, the English-speaking world is at the forefront of using these technologies? Uh, you know, I hear these dim rumblings that the new parliaments like Estonia, and the Basque Parliament in Spain are the ones that really, you know, they're not bound by all their traditions. They're, yeah. They, they yeah, think creatively exactly about these right. issues. Um, it, yeah, it, it is an Anglo-Saxon focus project, partly because it's funded <laughs> Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> um, no, you're right. New parliaments, um, and uh, Estonia has been one of the ones, but you can see it in a UK context. So Scotland, in terms Scotland of this project, would be the third, country, actually. Uh, yeah. It's written in. It's written in when the parliament selected was mention of technology and what technology can do. Underlying that was the attitude of the Scots as well, is that we're not going to be Westminster. Yeah. So we're not going to be Westminster, and we're not going to be like the Westminster model, and we can use technology to build a new politics. And I think that's entirely right. <coughs> I think more interesting things could well be happening, but in, in well, they are happening in newer forms, because they're not hidebound by this culture and this tradition. Westminster is, is terrible. I'll just give you a little anecdote about which might give you an insight into Westminster. We did an interview with one MP and I was asking him about why Westminster, why it was so painfully slow to get anything done, apart from the fact that there's about 36 committees that deal with anything to do with IT stuff. He said, look, what you've got to understand about this place is that some people think that the abolition of top hats was a radical step forward. <laughs> he said, that explains the pace of change in this place. <laughs> but you're right, where you've got new parliaments, um, and they're not hidebound by these traditions, and they can create it, and they can create, you know, and, and technology is sort of built in rather than grafted on. It's much easier. The Australian one was quite interesting, though, because the, the, the federal parliament in Canberra is a relatively new parliament building, 88, late 80s, something like that. So it, it was built sort of for the computer era, sort of, just about. But the problem there was that there was no drive to, to modernise Parliament because they felt the building was already new and they'd already, you know, it was sort of modern anyway. So they did, whereas in Westminster, at least there was a modernisation drive which was prompting them to think about technology. So there's a sort of, there's a sort of halfway house. But the thrust of your question is right, I think. Mm -hmm. I think new, new Parliaments, it, it's sort of easier for them to, to, to do it because they can build it into the fabric rather than graft it on. If I could just ask one other yeah. question, I think of the, you know, the... Oxford Internet Institute and the Hansard Society as sort of major players, but I also get the sense that there's more of a tight-knit culture among people that study e-democracy in Britain than in the United States. It's a small world. It's a very small world. I mean, there's some of the organizations I've mentioned here, um, we're talking about a handful of individuals. So Tom Steinberg's name keeps cropping up. All the My Society initiatives, it's a relatively small group of people. It's the same in the academic world as well. It's the same, you know, there's a relative, I meet the same people over and over again, you know. Um, it is a small world. <coughs> and um, you can see that played out. In terms, and they're all gathered around London as well. That's the other thing. So. What do you make of the 10 Downing Street Twitter feed? Yeah, I saw that. I haven't looked at that closely. <coughs> I, I know that Twitter first has only just emerged last, was it last year when the deputy leadership of the Labour Party 
um, campaign. I started using it. I'm not quite sure what to make of that yet. I, I think it's probably just a, at this stage, it's probably just a knee jerk. Here's the technology, let's try. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's often how they start. It's just, oh, well, it's something new, let's jump on this. I don't know. Um, to me, it's not very surprising that there wasn't a big political effect from the blogs because there was no intent to have political change. It's just about increasing the efficiency of existing systems and increasing the electability of the people that are writing these blogs. And it's not it's not really a dialogue. It's about people being able to present their message, maybe get some like advice and consent from various activists. But I mean, why why would it change anything? That would be surprising based yeah. on its design. Except if you look in the literature, a lot of the the distance between the literature and then I, I said this yesterday, the distance between the literature and then the principles of what's going on is is enormous because you get all this hype about what it can do and people talking in very high level terms about <coughs> democracy. I suppose to be fair, actually, in the, for instance, in the UK, I said after the 2001 election when the turnout dropped, there was a panic basically, uh, and people were latching onto anything there. So people did have quite initially have quite high expectations of what the technology might do. But you're right, when it gets into the real world of politics, what, what are people interested in? They're interested in much lower levels of, of uh, aspirations, what they can do for them, you know, can they get some votes out of this, you know, is there ways of making my life easier on a daily basis, all those sort of things. But it's the disjuncture, which is one of the reasons why we set out to do some of this research, is that there simply is no empirical you know, evidence there. There was a lot of speculation and there's a lot of high level theorizing, but not much empirical evidence. There's still, you know, still pretty patchy, you know, about in terms of what we've got. So, would you say that this means, you're not saying that the internet has limited potential for democracy, you're saying that blogging, politician blogging has limited effect, or how broadly would you apply the, your results? Sorry, sir, I'm speaking again. Well, I mean, Obviously, it seems like the results of political blogging are pretty negative from the perspective of improving, based on your research. Yeah, yeah. No, nothing much really changed. So, I mean, does this make you pessimistic about other kinds of technology, like, you know, the Downing Street Twitter feed or something, or you think it's just this particular... I think it's politics that's got to change and not, not, not the technology. The technology... The technology can make a little bit of difference around the edges, but, but it, it's really that... I said at the end there that we're entering an era, and I don't think politicians really now have got a grasp. They've got to relearn how they represent people. They've got to relearn how to govern or governance. And at the moment, I don't think they know what they're doing. You know, I think they're struggling and searching around for... And the, the old certainties have gone from them, but they can't latch on to anything new. So the technologies can be a useful tool, but, but most of them don't really have a strategy for... for using them anyway will they make a difference in that high level aspirational terms no because that would be unrealistic i think they can contribute at a local level for instance and i showed people yesterday with a guy called tom watson one of the first bloggers he's run his blog now for four or five years he didn't start it with high level aspirations of creating a new form of democracy but he says it's made a change to him you know and the way that he relates and also the feedback that he gets so it, I think it's about maybe scaling down some of the expectations and then putting together all these little changes and seeing what happens and also the indirect effects. The political world is very slow to change. If you look around, you know, things are changing pretty pretty massively and amazingly um, in some aspects. And so, you know, eventually the political sphere will have to at least play catch up. So there's a lot of questions and I have no idea now who, who is first and who wasn't. So I'm going to jump in. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go. Oh, I, I just wanted to sort of just try to take the focus off the politicians because they're not yeah. going to change and don't have much incentive to change. Mm -hmm. um, can, could we force them to be more open, more transparent, so that citizens uh, have better access to the information to create the my societies <coughs> and the uh, and the blog posts for them that allow the public to focus on? Yes, and that's already happening to a certain degree. I think the My Society stuff has opened up certain things. Shall I just tell you a little downside to the My Society type approach, though, as well, that you may or may not be aware of? My Society, through analysing the way that MPs vote and what they speak on in Parliament, and they've got all this data about you know um, how often uh, MPs speak in Parliament and what they do and how they respond to constituents, 
they created, I think, league tables. You know, who were the best responders, who weren't, all this sort of thing. Now, league tables, it's quite funny to see MPs being hoisted by their own petard because they like to enforce league tables on any, every other sector of the community. But the, the downside to that was people started to notice that MPs were interjecting in debates with no apparent purpose, you know, just making little, getting up, making a little comment and sitting down. And so there's some sort of anecdotal evidence, well, not anecdotal evidence, because some MPs have admitted it, that all they're doing is something to raise the profile up the, up the tables. You know, so you've got to be slightly careful there. But, but, but yes, um, I, I have some sympathy with MPs, though, as well. I, I do think, you know, I, I do think that they, you know, they, they make life tough for themselves, but, but also they, they've got a tough, a tough job. But, yeah, they're not going to do it of their own free will, necessarily, apart from the more forward-thinking ones. So um, you were very careful of not uh, uh, providing us specific uh, criticisms of the uh, very similar five or six hundred websites on the same piece. If you were elected as an MP tomorrow mm -hmm. and in a non-disputed um, uh, district, what would, would your website uh, look like? It would probably look like theirs, if I'm honest. <laughs> uh, you know, because again, it goes back to incentives, doesn't it? What is your incentive to do? If you know you've got, if your majority in the UK, for instance, is, let's say, 10, 15, 20,000, and you're probably going to be elected for the next 20 or 30 years, what's your incentive to actually do an enormous amount? Okay, you can be conscientious and do things, but at the end of the day, you're going to probably prioritise still the things that you think make a difference. Now, the reason why perhaps they don't spend as much time as we might think they should on websites is that they still believe that, for instance, that local newspaper coverage is far more important than having a glossy or interactive or nice website. So they'll spend their time, and this is probably what I do to begin with, you spend your time getting press coverage and name recognition in the local press. Because, first of all, your basic problem is that 65% of your electorate won't even know who you are. Uh, they don't know your name. So constantly for the next four years, what you've got to try and do is try and just raise your name profile and just make sure that you mobilise the people necessary to keep you being elected. So if I was being, you know, being cynical, that's probably what I'd do. If, if on the other hand, I wanted to do something more interesting with my website, then I think I'd start thinking about the, the dialogue model and the interactions. Whether it be blogging, I, I don't know. Um, the social networking thing that, that, that representatives have just jumped onto in the UK and Australia is sort of interesting. There's a few interesting things going on there, um, but it's too early to say how that's going to play out. Uh, there was an example in here that I, I could have shown. Was a, there's a guy called Steve Webb, um, appropriately named, um, who has been probably at the forefront of, of some innovative use of the technologies, and he now has... He's on both MySpace and, and Facebook, and he has something like 2,300 friends, which for an MP is quite a lot. You know, they're pretty <laughs> friendless people, aren't they? You know? um, but he has a distinct strategy. One of the things that he said, the reason why he's using this technology is his constituency has, I think, quite a large proportion of students. I think that might be down. Now, students, of course, tend to disappear off to other constituencies. They're probably still entitled to vote in his constituency, but a lot of them then don't. That's the problem. One way of keeping in touch with him, he's decided, is through Facebook. And he has now quite a large number. He claims to have over a thousand of his own constituents, which is quite a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. But not only has he got this network, he's also, he claims, consulting them online about issues and getting feedback. And he thinks that he's hitting now, especially with this younger student group, he's hitting people that wouldn't normally communicate with him, which I think is sort of interesting. But of course, he's uh, underlying it. He's driven for electoral purposes. He needs to communicate. He's not always, but he's actually built his majority. That's one of the things he's been doing over there. I think he's building up the size of his majority, and it's been built partly through this sort of contact model. Um, so there's there's two elements to that. One is a crude electoral one, but also he does have a. I think I think he has a genuine interest in in also building those sort of networks, and I think that's interesting. And it's going to be interesting to see how that. It's relatively early to see how that works. So that's something I. I Hello. How are you? I'm very well. Good to see you. That's a surprise. 
we'll, we'll talk after this. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Uh, um, you, you've looked at several countries. Yeah. And um, would you say that um, of, of two functions, one has clearly dominated, but the question is why? One function, transparency, uh, which is what sort of the academic approach to the internet and, and uh, the, those sort of proponents of the internet as a democratic tool, but the other is publicity and particularly one-way publicity. Um, one, one explanation is that obviously those who are in charge don't want to change, uh, but is there more to it than that that led to the publicity becoming the, 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 the primary function of the internet? Maybe it goes back to this idea about cu the culture of politicians, and I said about maybe it requires a generational shift. Most politicians, aren't they, the, the world over, I suppose, are the average age, I think, of a politician both in the UK and Australia is somewhere in their early 50s. Mm -hmm. They're what you might call here digital immigrants, yeah? If that, even some of them are from use the technology at all. I think we're not going to see that sort of... Because they, they still, what I'm saying is they still then relate to that broadcast model, that sort of publicity, the top-down, the press, you know, the way you do business is this, and that's it's a sort of hierarchical model. That's what they've grown up with. That's what they used to. You can see a slight shift in amongst the more recently elected younger ones. The people who perhaps used the technology before they came to Parliament, they've used it in a work context. They have a slightly different outlook on it. But it's going to be, what, another, maybe another 20 years before we see people who've grown up, I mean, grown up from birth with the technology, who perhaps think about it in completely different ways. I know you've got projects here on digital natives, and I'm just struck by the, the, the I mean, for instance, my students, the way that they use the technology compared to me, it's just, you know, it's just so different. And, and I'm sure I don't understand a lot of the things that they, they really do as much as I might try. And I think that mindset, is going to require generational shift. The, uh, don't you think they might adopt the institutional approach? They might adopt approach? the institutional approach. One of the things I didn't mention here, but in the context of it, is it depends on what one Australian described to me as the churn factor. So what he said was, if you just get at each election relatively small numbers of new MPs coming in, they'll be institutionalised into practice, and that's what tends to happen. If you get a huge turnover, like we did in 97, um, and I think in the Australian context, the last election might have made a difference as well. If you get a big turnover, then you tend to get shifts in attitudes. So 97 was important in the UK because you got a whole new generation of MPs who were younger. They came, with, they came to Parliament with expectations about the technology, well, first of all, they came expecting that they'd get a laptop and that they'd be able to, and they'd be able to do things. And when they got there, there wasn't even a plug on the wall, you know. So they had to do something about that. So there was a generational surge. So it sort of depends. Yeah, and one, they can get institutionalised fairly quickly, and that's the complaint of some of them. But I think if there's a, if you get those churns, as it were, you can then get a jolt forward and a difference in a, in approach. But the norms, cultures, and rules are pretty heavy in a place like Westminster. You know, it's um, you know they do they do become like residents of uh, you know old-fashioned mental institutions. After a while. <laughs> <laughs> they are sort of ingrained with the culture of the place. I know it's look the audience getting smaller and smaller. The longer <laughs> I speak, the more people drift away. Yeah, I think we'll wrap it into offline conversation. <laughs> yeah. If people yeah. have so no you can tell us what you really think. <laughs> 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 okay, well, thank you very much. Good